Hello again, wrestling fans. Welcome back to your favorite wrestling podcast, Ring Respect Radio, right here on the Video Bros Network. If you found us for the very first time, we're going to ask you to click the subscribe button down below and hit the notification bell. Give us a thumbs up and just show us a little bit of love. Get the name of Ring Respect Radio out there. I am Bobby Munson. I am one half of the Video Bros, and the other half of the Video Bros is on the line with me right now. He's the man with the angelic voice, the throat of the goat. You know him as Papa Smokes. How are you doing, sir? Hey, I'm doing great, Munson. How are you wrestling fans doing out there? Hopefully everybody's having a good old time, loving a, loving the wrestling that's available to them, and enjoying many of the great podcasts. Speaking of great podcasts, our friend Spencer Love joined us on the last episode of Ring Respect Radio. Great interview there. Go check that episode out again. Uh, also, go check out Backbreaker Media over in Alberta. They've been great to us as well, too, and putting our uh, putting us our name out there. We're all over the place now. We're on Podbean. We're on YouTube. Uh, you know, I... I do a quick Google search of Ring Respect Radio. We're popping up in places I didn't even know existed, Papa Smokes. Uh, all the podcasts, they're picking up Ring Respect Radio these days. Yeah, isn't that a great thing, too? I mean, it felt good, i got to say, from the humble beginnings we started with to uh, just tap on the podcast app on my iPhone and see that Ring Respect Radio is getting get put up there by our good buddies at Backbreaker Media. It's just... Uh, it's a thrill to think that we could be getting out to some more years and uh, build a, a better audience and uh, have some uh, good conversations about wrestling. Yeah, it's been fantastic so far. And just thank you to everybody who continues to support us and all of you who've just started joining us. Thank you as well to continue to show that love. Uh, here on Ring Respect Radio, we like to talk about a lot of different topics. Uh, and lately, we've been doing a lot of these recap reviews of MLW Fusion. Uh, Major League Wrestling have been putting on some fantastic shows uh, since their comeback after the pandemic. Uh, pretty much locked most wrestling companies out of business for a while, but MLW Fusion came back. They did great at the end of 2020, and 2021's kick it off in the high gear. And we've been talking about this one for weeks on the show. This is Filthy Island. I said to you, Papa Smokes, this one kind of deserves its own episode for so many reasons. Some great, maybe not, some not so great. We'll get into more details as we go along here. But Filthy Island, they've been promoting this for weeks. Uh, Team Filthy and Filthy Tom Lawler going to be putting on this. I, I guess this would be an episode of MLW Fusion, kind of. But this is their take on it. Almost a play on... Dana White's Fight Island, and we know about Tom Dollar and his uh, background in MMA. So here we were. We're finally going to get to find out. And I guess the first thing I got to say, uh, Tom Lawler on uh, commentary for this, along with Dan Lambert, and no ropes on the ring that's set up there on Filthy Island. Uh, maybe even uh, before we get started, why don't you just uh, give the fans a little bit of a rundown of what this all looked like in case they haven't seen it, Papa Smokes. <laughs> But like we've talked about in uh, previous episodes leading up to this, we we were unsure of what the island was going to be at the very beginning. When we knew it would be an episode of the show, but as we went along and got more information, it became clear that it was going to be Tom Lawler's own fight card, and he made it um, look more like a, an MMA-style uh, fighting card uh, like you said, without ropes on the ring so that there was uh, more of a grappling-based thing on the mat there. But, uh, I, yeah, I think this whole thing was a, a, a satire and a, a parody of, of Fight Island that Dana White was trying to get going to to uh, skirt over the uh, COVID issues and still have his uh, pay-per-view fights. Um, I don't really know of, of Lawler's background with Dana White, but I'm assuming uh, it's not good because he's uh, he's definitely mocking him here. The whole uh, the whole uh, compound that Phil the Island takes place in had a was extremely junky, and they had some old couches and some drunken bums kind of watching the action and stuff. And uh, they're all the time uh, Lawler and Lambert are trying to pretend like it's this paradise island and everything when really they thrown together a pretty junky little production. It, it, it's funny. It was pretty interesting. And and uh, the one thing I, I liked about it uh, outside of the satire he was making is that uh, it was just kind of nice to have a different looking episode of the show, uh, uh, not in the same venue. 
thought with that same ring and such, uh, uh, yeah, it was just kind of something different and something fun to do. And they, they changed the locale to uh, Oahe, Hawaii. And uh, I, I mean, it kind of looked nice in a way. Uh, the show was uh, kind of felt uh, like a patchwork thing that kind of came together in spite of itself. But uh, I think it achieved what it uh, intended to. And that was just uh, a little breath of fresh air for the viewer and a a little fun had at the expense of Dana White. Yeah, and then, uh, of course, the different commentary. We had Tom Lawler and Dan Lambert, like I mentioned, and quite a few uh, good jokes coming out of, uh, especially out of Tom Lawler. Uh, Dan Lambert got into it as it went along. I mean, there was some slams at Dana White that I found in there, too, that I thought were funny. But, man, did I have a good chuckle at the low-key comments that they were making. And nothing yeah. against low-key, but when they're coming up with uh, names like low pay-per-view buy rate and... Uh, low IQ and stuff, and I think the low IQ one is stuck even in uh, more recently on MLW as well too. I I had a good chuckle at some of those comments from the two of them. Well, they were actually pretty good commentators. Uh, aside from that, I thought like they had their uh, chemistry quite good, and uh, like Lambert is quite a good speaker. He's an intelligent guy and a and a sarcastic jerk at the same time too. And, and, and Lawler's very funny and has a wacky sense of humor, but they actually, uh, they did the commentary quite well. They, they sold what they had to sell and they didn't bring up what they didn't want to. And uh, I thought they worked out fairly well, at least for one episode as a commentary team. Yeah. And the nice thing is, is Tom Lawler, a very knowledgeable man when it comes to holds and stuff too. So we're getting a lot of uh, talk about the holds that were being seen inside some of the fights here on fight Island or sorry, filthy Island, mind you. Uh, it was great to hear. I really enjoyed the commentary side of it. I think it kept the flow of what we saw going throughout the entire episode and uh, would, you know, eventually lead to what we got in the end of the episode, which we will get to eventually or two. Uh, so, I think it's time to maybe just kick off uh, Filthy Island from uh, the get-go. Uh, very first uh, matchup that we had on the card. Uh, this was Dominic Gabrini taking on, uh, let me try to pronounce this here, Wanu Luo. Uh, is that how we pronounce it, or did you get something different there, Pop Smokes? I, I'd say that's quite sufficiently close enough, yeah, yeah. All right, sounds good. Yeah, so what uh, do you think of this uh, first encounter here from Filthy Island? Yeah, well, first of all, we had to get ri get used to this ring with no ropes and uh, being out in the middle of this field somewhere. And uh, it really was kind of uh, bizarre and funny to watch at the beginning. I knew you would be enjoying uh, the, uh, the the music man they had there, which was <laughs> everybody's favorite preliminary talent, Bud Heavy, working the ghetto blaster and signaling the guys to come out to quite extremely funny uh, to me for sure and uh, yeah this just looked like a crappy backyard production but the thing was they had a good roster and uh, some interesting matches going on yeah and i got i kind of want to throw it out there uh, bud heavy if uh, you ever want to run uh, music for ppw down the road uh, feel free to give myself and baba smokes a shout because we got we got work for you there uh, we could use a good music guy here prairie pro wrestling well, and Spencer Love has kind of uh, inspired me too. Why don't we send an uh, email to Bud Heavy and try and interview him on the show? I like that, Tyler. That sounds like a good challenge. I think Bud Heavy would fit in perfectly here on Ring Respect Radio. So I think uh, I think we should do that. Uh, good idea, Pop Smokes. We're going to get on that for I, sure. I bet you nobody else has had him as a guest on their podcast yet. No, I think uh, hey, that could gather a lot of interest for sure. Definitely. So. Um, so this match, obviously, um, this one used to, in the same way a lot of kickoff matches on other MLW shows are used for, uh, to really get one of their uh, names over. And Dominic Gabrini, somebody that they want to get put over uh, guest, against, uh, you know, essentially a prelim talent and everything. And that's what we got. We got Gabrini getting in there and being able to uh, show what he can do. Uh, get his get his shit in and basically win by a tap out, making himself look strong moving forward. Yeah, yeah, and he also played the coward at the beginning of that match because he uh, bailed out of the ring once he saw his uh, unusual but large opponent and uh, was telling uh, Tom Lawler at ringside, I'm not doing this, this guy too bad. Uh, they made him get back in and, of course, his... Uh, Tremendous jujitsu skill kicked in, and he quite easily got the choke out win. But uh, yeah, they, they're they're building Garini 
the as a cowardly heel type character, and I think it, I think it's a good one for him. Uh, he's obviously a talented athlete and all that, but he uh, he still doesn't seem quite uh, completely comfortable in the pro wrestling setting yet. And they, I don't know if they time he's he's got his tag team now and everything, and uh, he's in a faction with a, a top guy in MLW and Tom Waller. So uh, I think that that'll just come along with time. Yeah, it was a good way to kick this night off and everything like that. Uh, I enjoy it. I like Dominic Garini. I think uh, there's a lot to be said about his work, and I think we're going to see some great things out of him. So good win there for him, uh, being able to establish him and even, you know, in some sense, flesh him out a little bit more because, again, he's kind of been a little bit silent, you know, in the in the background as part of this uh, Team Filthy. Uh, Bart is the tag team violence is forever. We got to see a little bit more of his personality shine through in this match. And I think that was a very good positive coming out of this one. Yeah, agreed, agreed. So from there, I believe we had the start of the Aztec jungle fight between Neil Mortez and Savio Vega and uh, dubbed as a glorious offer of violence. Um, This one, the Aztec jungle fight. I I, I don't know where I really want to sit on this one because we're going to have to come back to it uh, later on in what we're talking about because it started here it ends later in the night it goes on multiple times but this was i i mean i hate to say this pop smokes this felt poorly put together and it was two guys that are maybe just a little bit too far in their career to really do anything too exciting so it kind of came off very sluggish and very tiresome in many ways in this one yeah yeah uh the, the main thing I liked about this fight was just the idea that uh, it was it, it was held in a different spot than the uh, than the other matches in Hawaii. This was supposed to be at Chichen Itza, which is in uh, which is in uh, Mexico, and uh, they had it at night. And um, it, it was meant to have kind of the uh, supernatural type feel that uh, Selena De La Renta has been. Uh, uh, invoking with Mil Muertes about, uh, you know, that, that uh, she wants a sacrifice to be made, a blood sacrifice, and she, she's she been uh, having those uh, promos where she's been talking about so much kind of witchy, supernatural stuff. So this kind of reminded me a little bit of the uh, backlay bra- uh, bare-knuckle brawl between Hammerstone and uh, and. Mads Kruger from a couple weeks ago. They they went on location. They had a little special gimmick match, a little special gimmick fight, kind of. But you know, when it comes down to it, there's there's not a lot you can do without a ring and and all that. And uh, this ended up being some some brawling and some punching and a shaky camera. And the, the uh, commentators were were sufficiently creeped out that they didn't want to be there. They were also very uncomfortable and. Uh, it was an interesting concept and all that, but this this match didn't totally do it for me. Uh, I like Mil Muerte a whole bunch, but uh, yeah, uh, like you, I, I guess we'll be coming back to this match because the end doesn't happen until later in the show, but uh, I was a little skeptical about this one, and it, it never really picked up in my mind after that either. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%, Papa Smokes. And so, uh, so yeah, again, we're going to come back to it, not spend too much time here. Uh, right after they kind of opened up this idea happening, uh, we had a promo from Los Parks, in particular L.A. Park coming forth, and he wants to lay down the challenge to Alexander Hammer- Hammerstone. He wants that never, or, sorry, the open weight championship uh, Hammerstone's been we- wearing for almost two consecutive years now. Uh, so L.A. Park making that challenge to Hammerstone. Uh, a couple of questions here on this one. I got to ask. Uh, is Hammerstone going to be able to handle L.A. Park? And not saying that he wouldn't normally be able to, but he's gotten himself so in deep with Contra and Mods Kruger that having another faction of guys coming at him, is this going to turn out to be too much for uh, our boy Hammer? Yeah, that's a totally fair question, too. And, and as we've seen with Lost Parks, they they don't uh, care if they fight fair. Uh, we just saw them watch, or we saw them win the tag team championship a couple of weeks ago against the Von Ericks with, man, they pulled every trick out of the book, all the dirty tricks they used, uh, including uh, Tom Lawler, a special referee who was dirty as hell in that. And uh, 
having another member of the Parka family uh, uh, hiding under the ring and, and substituting himself in as a fresh guy without the referee's knowledge. And yeah, they've shown that they're completely underhanded. And uh, as uh, as uh, L.A. Park said in that promo, they they had the tag team champions, but championships, but wouldn't that open weight change? Nice gift for the new owner of uh, of uh, of the promotions that uh, Selena De La Renta is working with, and they so yeah, I think they also have their eyes on the uh, heavyweight championship too. So Lost Parks really just driven, <clears throat> excuse me, and motivated to get all the gold in MLW. They want it all, and it's it's looking like they won't stop till they get it. Yeah, and. I think uh, you, you bring up the the owner of Azteca Underground, uh, saying it would yeah. be a great thing for him. Is this not, I believe, the first time in the night where they mention the name El Jefe? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. They that's just uh, that just means uh, the chief or whatever, the the leader, I guess. But uh, they're not going to say him by name yet. But uh, definitely the. Uh, the uh, Mexican side of the uh, talent roster, including Lost Parks, are wanting to get in good with the new owner for sure. Okay, yeah. So I wanted just wanted to clear that up because I think that's the first mention of anybody using the term El Jefe and stuff like that, and it does get brought up here again really soon as well. So I just wanted to get, get that clear. Um, so from there, uh, we actually went over to a video of Alexander Hammerstone and Richard Holiday arriving on the island of Hawaii. Um, little confused about why they were uh, asked to come out to Filthy Island, but I guess a uh, personal invite from Filthy Tom Lawler himself, inviting a couple of spectators to see what he's got going down there in uh, Hammerstone and Holiday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was also kind of confused by this, too. That they weren't uh, slated for any matches or anything, but uh, just a little appearance. And I, I think it's just another thing to show the stroke that Hammerstone has in that company, uh, whether anyone is actually allied with him or not, they, they still uh, they know he's one of the top stars in the company, if not the top star. So uh, everyone kind of wants a piece of Hammerstone. If if you're around in uh, MLW these days, you're probably doing pretty good. Yeah, so uh, again, that's going to flesh out a little bit more later in the night. Uh, again, we go back now to more of Mil Mertes and Savio Vega, this time... We got a glimpse of the actual Aztec temple in this shot. And then on the screen, it said that El Jefe says, blood will pour for all believers. So an interesting mention here. And maybe piqued at my interest a little bit more about what was going to go down with Savio Mil Mortes. I, I can't say it piqued it incredibly much because, again, I still knew what the limitations were going to be, both with the style of match and with the competitors. i uh, taken nothing away Again, from Will Muertes, uh, who I do enjoy a lot. Uh, it's just, again, you're taking two guys who have been around quite a long time, both bigger guys, uh, both going to have that kind of, uh, you know, type of style that's going to maybe slow things down a little bit and kind of just felt a little bit out of place. But again, this one little bit of promo and that video, I think, was probably one of the highlights I can pick out of this entire Aztec jungle fight so far. Yeah, yeah, and I, I like that you brought up, uh, again, some of uh, Selena's lines of, uh, about sort of the occult and and sort of uh, Inca or Mayan uh, mysticism about the blood pouring and stuff. It, I found it interesting because I went to uh, Cancun, Mexico a couple of years in the Yucatan Peninsula over on the east side there, and I, I went to Chichen Itza as a tour and saw the old pyramids. And in fact, that, that is part of it is that we all know that uh, there were blood sacrifices of uh, humans back in those days in those areas, but they also, um, they have a part where uh, they would do some of the sacrifices towards the top of the pyramid. And then the, the they had actual um, small little troughs kind of where the blood would run down and it would touch like all of the pyramid and then come down to the bottom of it where the people were. And this is all highly symbolic uh, in their, uh, in their worldview and in their religion and stuff. So I, I like those, uh, those references to the uh, occult and mystical past of the, of the Yucatan people there. It, it just adds a, uh, 
it adds a reality that kind of gives you a little chill when you think about it too and you think that that stuff actually happened and that uh, they're uh, in that area where those things happened and uh, I thought it was nicely done it, it made for a creepy creepy atmosphere yeah and I, I hope nobody takes this the wrong way that you know my uh, I guess not big love for the actual finish or how this went down in this matchup it has nothing to do with the the build around it or any of the uh the culture built around it because that part of it is absolutely spot on and i love it and i think that selena and everybody involved are doing a fantastic job over there i just again we'll get to it in a bit but this the 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 execution of the fight fell a little flat but again we'll pick up on that here shortly um, so from there, we had another um, fight scheduled. Uh, this one scheduled to be Kevin Koo of uh, Team Filthy, Violence is Forever, uh, taking on our boy Zenshi. And uh, before, yeah. before we even get started, man, Zenshi, once again, he comes, he, what do you come out of the fucking trees there, Paul? I mean, he dove out of nowhere into the, the attack on Kevin Koo. I, I popped out of my seat right at that moment, I got to say. <laughs> Yeah, we just spent the last episode uh, stroking off Zenji, even, even in a losing effort here. And then uh, he comes to the next episode, he comes in his match and makes the coolest entrance of anybody, uh, flying into the ring out of a tall tree where no one even saw him up there. That, that was just beautifully done. Yeah. And I, I got to say, um, there was that spot he did in the corner post there where he kind of he held himself sideways on the post. Very, very yeah. athletic. Maybe he was getting a little bit too much with the old posing, uh, showing off the athletics a bit and stuff, and could have got a little bit more down to the serious nature of it because he had already done the big spot coming out of the trees. But again, Zenchi, he's young. He wants to be able to show that he can do these things. And I mean, take nothing away from him. I mean, fuck, I'd never be able to do that if I dreamed of it kind of thing, Bob Smokes. I mean, that athleticism is is far none when it comes to Zenchi. And then... He gets in there with a guy the caliber of Kevin Koo, and we really got to see, I think, Kevin Koo take off in this matchup. We got to see exactly what he's all about, and I like the look and style of Kevin Koo. Yeah, I do too. I, I wasn't uh, familiar with him until he started in MLW. I've seen a couple of the tag matches. Uh, he's been all right, but he never really knocked it out of the park in, in my mind kind of thing and but in this match i liked this singles match because we got to see a bit more of his shit um the kind of move sets that he has and uh and the kind of ring awareness and all that and uh and and yeah in there against a game opponent as we know zenji he doesn't win a lot of matches but he's there and he uh He's a, he's a game opponent, and uh, th this was a good match. Ku pulled off the win, but uh, just barely. Yeah, then she getting closer and closer to that big win we keep talking about, and we, we keep yeah. praising him on the show, and I'm going to continue to praise him here, Papa Smokes. He's been a very big highlight for me on the MLW shows, and I didn't think I'd say that. Again, I, I like watching big guy fights. I, I really enjoy watching it because that's the kind of shit we grew up on. Um, but you know, Hey, these guys can really surprise us when they come out and make things interesting and show some great skill there. And that's exactly what we got. I mean, I can't get over the, the, the jump out of the trees did it for me. To me, I put it right down there. That is the highlight of filthy Island and bar none. Zenji once again, making the highlight of the show. Yeah, I, I can't disagree with that. And, uh, they, they had another couple of nice spots in that match because Ku uses as his finisher that uh, full Nelson suplex. Yeah. And he tried, he tried it on Zenshi the first time, and Zenshi flipped right out of it onto his feet. Wow, that looked really great. I yeah. wasn't expecting that, because that's not a lot of room and not a lot of height to get that full backflip in there, but he got it and landed done perfectly. But then, uh, of course, that ended up being... Uh, a finishing move for that match later, Koo hit that full Nelson suplex, and ooh, that looked completely devastating on a on a more slight frame like Zenshi. He landed hard on his shoulders and neck, and, and not unsafe, I don't think, but the spot looked really, really good. And yeah, convincing win for uh, for Koo. So Garini and Koo got their singles wins on Filthy Island that keeps their tag team looking strong and keeps Team Filthy looking strong and. Uh, 
I'm interested to see more from Koo in the future. He, he's obviously a martial artist that is uh, transitioning over to pro wrestling, so he still he looks a little bit green in the ring. He's just trying to uh, trying to meld the two styles together, I suppose, of the uh, of, uh, jiu-jitsu grappling and, and martial arts fighting, and plus the professional wrestling. He'll, he'll also get there, and he's coming along nicely, I think. And uh, to have those real martial artists that uh, make the transition just adds to the uh, intensity and believability of the talent, I think. Yeah, and I mean, it, both, both guys looking great to him. Yeah, like you said, that finishing move from Kevin Koo, just a thing of beauty. And then she sells it so damn well, too. I mean, like you said, it looked powerful, it looked strong, but it was definitely done safe. I watched closely on it. Man, Zenshi takes one hell of a fantastic bump. The guy knows how to make other guys look fantastic, and what a match. Great job by both. Uh, again, I'm picking it as my personal favorite piece of... I, my fir- personal favorite piece of actual wrestling on the entire show came from this matchup, I'd have to say. Yeah, yeah. And I, th- I think... Uh... I think our praise for Zenshi is warranted in a way, too, because as you notice, he has a match on every single show, so that shows that he's, he's excellent preliminary talent and excellent at getting over the uh, stars that are above him on the card. So, yeah, he gets constant and steady work. Uh, what more can you ask for, right? Yeah, and constant, steady coverage on Ring Respect Radio, so keep it up, Zenshi. We're loving you. So, uh, from there, we had uh, the Von Erichs kicking in and uh, talking about things uh they're on their ranch they are doing i believe this is where they kicked in with instagram live so we were talking before the show went on the air and talking a little bit about how uh some of this feels like it might have been pre-taped and most likely was pre-taped but i believe the von erics probably did an actual instagram live there and made everything look perfectly uh throughout the show from that point of view and everything like that and we're able to play it into the later happenings in the episode that we'll talk about but uh, while they're doing this, they're talking about uh, talking about filthy Tom Lawler. They're talking about the main event having to be there for low key. Want to make sure that he's not going to get you know himself into a bad situation there, being surrounded by members of Team Filthy. And so they said, "Crash that party, Pop Smokes! Crash that party!" Yeah, yeah. And uh, you knew that when uh, Filthy Island was going to be in the Von Eric's backyard that they probably were going to make an appearance of some kind. We just didn't know when, but uh, they, their enemies were uh, kicking around in the same area, so they're going to take that opportunity to raise some hell. Yeah, and looking forward to seeing how that pans out later in the night. Uh, right after that, we went right back to that Aztec jungle match again. Here we are once again talking about it. Uh, we saw some kicks and punches from both men, and yeah, some more uh scared commentators and that's about all i've got to add to the aztec jungle match beginning there how about you papa smokes yeah i'm looking at my notes here and i you know i started to uh I wrote down the combatants in the match and i was ready to take some notes and then i never really did take any notes because i didn't see uh, what there was to write there was some brawling and such going on in this but until the conclusion of this match, we won't have uh, too much of interest to talk about. Yeah, exactly. So uh, from there, uh, uh, something else was added to this show. We had an interview where Alicia Toot was interviewing uh, TJP, talking about uh, the, well, basically questioning on whether or not he is a bully, uh, talking about his uh, betrayal of Buku Dao or whatever uh, recently after their tag team t- uh, title match loss. And uh, trying to trying to basically get to the idea that TJP might be a bully, but of course TJP had his sen- his say in it, and he doesn't believe that he's a bully. He believes that he's really just kind of tuning uh, the young guy in and stuff like that, and the ba- believing that his mentor in Buku Dao needed to show him more respect. Yeah, I, I kind of liked this segment. I thought it was very interesting because I always think that the most uh, compelling stories and or angles in professional wrestling are the things that are real uh like real drama that they bring into the angle kind of and, and i i not trying to say that tjp and buku dao have real heat with each other but this is a real issue in wrestling and in the rest of the world uh, at large about bullying and uh, 
and about uh, people's feelings uh, being hurt and uh, people being in distress over uh, bullying type situations and uh, I thought Alicia brought it up very well as she uh, seemed like a very caring person about that and was worried about Buku Dao and uh, and I, I liked uh, I thought TJP was quite well spoken too and uh, the way he really flared up when she used that word bully and he said are you kidding me like you should have seen when I got into the business and I had guys above me and they didn't give a damn about me either. And, uh, you know, I put my head down and I kept my mouth shut and I learned and I did my job and, uh, whatever happened to me is, is gone. I got past that because I, I weathered the storm and I was strong and I got through it and that's what he needs to do too. And I was kind of listening to that thinking, well, like that, that makes a lot of sense. I, I I don't support bullying uh, in the least, and I, I'm not uh, supporting an argument that supports it. But, uh, you know, there, there's two sides to every story, too. And it was interesting to hear uh, TG, TG, TJP talk about his early days in the business as well. Yeah, and I mean, those mentions are great mentions because if uh, anyone like ourselves who have been backstage or been a part of uh, seeing some of the training that goes on with professional wrestling and stuff like that. One of the main things, especially out in our neck of woods anyway, that I always heard was, you know, to basically show respect to those who came before you and stuff like that. You want to be in there shaking hands, learning from all these guys, everything like that. Uh, keep your head down, your ears open. That was one of the main things I always heard. Head down, ears open, and uh, wait for your opportunities. And then, uh, yeah, show the respect along the way. And that's exactly what made sense about this whole thing to me was TJP saying, like, you think that was bad. Uh, you should have seen what shit was like before and stuff like that. And, yeah, I think this is a great setup. I think uh, I'm excited to hear Buku Dao's response to this. And, inevitably, I think uh, we're going to see a matchup between these two. Yeah, yeah, possibly a whole series. And, and I think uh, the guys will be able to work great together. But, uh yeah, I, I think this is a good angle in using a real-life uh, uh, issue that's going on in the world now, a kind of a hot-button issue. And uh, yet that very word alone, bullying, just really is, is a strong word now, and it elicits uh, strong reactions from people, as we saw from T.J. Perkins in that uh, in that uh, little promo he did there, I thought it was very well done. And I, I think this is an angle that could uh, grow wings and, and really make for a good program later on. Yeah, definitely looking forward to it. They've done a nice job setting it all up. Uh, we'll see where it goes from there. Uh, so up next, uh, we have a, let's see here, another matchup actually. Yeah, so the, here's my boy Gringo Loco hitting the ring again there, Papa Swags, after having a good discussion about him recently uh so yeah gringo loco taking on rocky romero rocky romero appearing from new japan pro wrestling and uh yeah what uh what an interesting uh matchup between these two i guess i got uh my second taste of gringo loco in this one and this time i gotta say uh you know i saw a little bit more out of gringo loco and maybe starting to appreciate more of what he's capable of i think again he still serves his place on the roster but he served it nicely here and we got a uh, very respectable, respectable, good matchup here on the on the card. Yeah, it was uh, it was okay. I think um, with the two styles of these two competitors, which are you know, somewhat similar, I think somewhat lucha based, and uh, and uh, I think uh, like for me, this match highlighted the lack of ropes in that ring because this is too. These are two wrestlers that really, really use the ropes a lot. The ropes and the corners for climbing up. And uh, without them, I thought both these guys looked a little bit lost. I, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. They're, they're used to working in a ring with, with ropes around it. But um, to me, this was kind of like the style of these guys didn't work. Like a guy like Zenshi kind of kind of adapted to it a little bit better than both these guys did. Um, Gringo Loco looked a little bit lost. I've seen him have some pretty good matches. He's not a favorite of mine or anything like that, but he's for a guy of his body type and such like that. He can really fly and he's pretty quick, but in this match, he didn't have 80% of his arsenal at his disposal, nor did Romero for that matter. 
when they couldn't run the ropes and uh, leap off of the ropes and springboard over the ropes. And uh, so this match suffered, in my mind, a little bit for that. You liked it a little bit better than that? I th- you know, I think at this point, I, I, I do have to say, I think I liked it a little bit more. And I do see your points and I, I understand them for sure. I think maybe at this point, because we had been a little bit without any real action other than uh, throwing in uh, more of the Aztec jungle stuff and everything, I, I think I was just ready for a match. And I, I guess I got somewhat of that here. I believe, wasn't this the uh, where... Uh, did, is this the one where they did the spot into the couch, though? If I'm not mistaken, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, I mean, it was a little goofy at that point. I gotta, I gotta admit that. But I mean, considering the element of what was around there and most guys doing that suicide dive to the outside in most matches nowadays, it was a little comical in a in an okay way to watch them do that kind of similar move right into that dirty old couch that's sitting there at ringside. So yeah. I didn't mind that part of it, I guess, and. Uh, I didn't dislike the match. I, I enjoy Rocky Romero. I got to say, I, I do like his work. I think there's a uh, great potential there. So, I mean, I think I just hope it out better things for Rocky Romero. But... Yeah. Yeah. I like Romero too. And it saved it a little bit for me uh, at the end with the finish that Romero uh, used the ring post to kick off for that tornado DDT. Did that, that looked cool. That, that, the fact that they never really used anything about the ring until that finish move. Then he had an idea. He, when he once he got up in the air, he kicked off of that ring post and used it for momentum into his finish. That that worked for me. That that uh, that kind of saved it, in my opinion. Yeah, definitely. So I mean, but yeah, it was what it was. It was all right. And again, Rocky Romero picking up a win, looking strong. I hope we're going to see a lot more of him in MLW. Uh, we've talked about it before, the international flavor uh, being utilized in MLW a lot. And that's what I love seeing. I love seeing some of these guys from New Japan coming over and taking part in it, along with, uh, you know, some of the guys from AAA and some of these other promotions as well. I think we get to see a great uh, blend of different styles. And that's what Fusion really is all about, is seeing the different blend of wrestling styles from all around the world. And they're really putting it on display here. So, Happy to see Rocky Romero and many of the others that we're getting uh, from around the world. For sure. Nice win for him and a uh, good match. Yeah. Uh, from there, again, return to Mil Mortez, Savio Vega, and the Aztec Jungle fight. Uh, this time around, though, we got this interception from Contra, uh, Joseph Samael coming in, and he's doing a promo on jo- Jordan Oliver. Uh, I know we talked a little bit about this. Um wasn't really too sure what to think in a sense. Like, what, how did Contra get uh, the capability of intercepting a, uh, you know, a broadcast being put on by Tom Lawler? And, you know, I mean, maybe these answers will come about sometime. Or maybe this was just, hey, we need to keep promoting because they were going to have a, you know, a bit of a, a week off kind of thing before hitting up the match between Oliver and Fatu for the championship. So again, they almost had to put the little bit of promotion in there. Not sure it was necessarily the right show to do it on, but again, who, who are we to say we're not the ones running the show? Yeah, yeah, they have a job to do too, like you said, in promoting that stuff. As we know, Contra doesn't play by the rules on Major League Wrestling. They uh, they don't uh, sit with Alicia too, or uh, just to you know, do promos as the other guys do. They interrupt because uh, Joseph Samuel's got his his soldiers and his workers everywhere, and they can they can interrupt the broadcast. So uh, just anything MLW that was coming on, they were they were gonna uh, they were gonna pump their guys and pump their matches during that. So yeah, fine with me. Anytime I get to listen to Joseph Samuel cut a promo, I'm pretty happy about him. Oh damn, he's good at cutting promos. I mean, he's absolutely yeah. fantastic. But yeah, definitely. Uh, So that went down. And then from there, this is where we got into the Von Erichs. Actually, I think this is when they officially hit that live stream on Instagram, driving around in their uh, truck and they're gearing down. They're heading down to the ring. They want to go. They're going to go straight down to Filthy Island, uh, which is right in their backyard. And they're ready to uh, they're ready to uh, maybe place an attack, do something. They're ready to fuck shit up is what it comes down to. Yeah, well put, Munson. Another thing I like about the Von Erics is that they're uh, entrance.
country's music is a stranglehold by Ted Nugent, and they're always listening to that song. Very, very nice, very fitting. I like it. Yeah, it works. It's so good. So I was pumped here because I'm like, you know, we're going to get the Von Erichs involvement. You know it's going to come later on, but uh, looking forward to seeing what happens. So uh, from there, now we got to talk about it. Here comes the finish and the return to the uh, Aztec Temple fight. Bill Mortez, Savio Vega. Uh, how how do you feel about how this went down in the end then, Bob Smokes? Well, I... I thought the end was the best part for sure. Uh, they were still brawling out at night in the jungles around uh, Chichen Itza and uh, all of a sudden a uh, bright blue tire iron showed up. Uh, I think Savio had it in his hand. Uh, Muertes uh, got a few shots in on Vega and then took that tire iron and uh, gave him a good shot across the head and this knocked Vega out cold. Apparently, he was down and not moving, whereupon Selena De La Renta shows up and tells Mil Muertes, finish the job and hands him a shovel. And now Mil Muertes is digging a grave, apparently, for Savio Vega. And this is how we went off the air from this particular match, at least. Uh, with, uh, Selena had promised the blood sacrifice to the... Uh, Azteca underground and to the uh, Incan gods and such. So uh, they're kind of putting it out there that uh, this might be the end of Salvio Vegas as we know it. So uh, very, uh, very interesting developments. Uh, did you like this part? Uh, are we going to have to wait till the next episode to see what happens? Yeah, and I mean, I liked how it ended. I think that it could have ended a lot sooner in this uh, context as well, too. I mean, there was so much going back to it, shots of the temple, shots of this, uh, just having the guy slugging it out for long periods of time. I almost think that the tire iron could have come into play even earlier on. Like you could have had Savio Vega aware of what he was getting himself into in not in his backyard, uh, playing right into uh, Mil Mortez's backyard, come in with that tire iron. And almost at that point, that's where you have it. Uh, Mil Mortez gets control of him uses the tire iron, knocks him out, and you cut to that whole scene with Selena saying to finish the job, give him the shovel, and he starts digging. I think you could have condensed down the entire segment that came across in, I think, about four different spots in the entire night down to a couple spots. You could have had the Aztec temple shown with the message about the blood sacrifice and everything like that, leading to a nice short piece at the end with this finish in it. I think would have been more than enough to make this a lot more interesting than it ended up being in the long term. Yeah, I can't disagree, but I suppose they uh, were just dealing with uh, time issues, so I uh, had to devote a certain amount of time to each match. But uh, yeah, I can't disagree with that, Months, and they, they could have shortened that one up a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so right after that, we got uh, Tom Lawler bringing uh, Alexander Hammerstone and Richard Holiday down to ringside kind of showing them everywhere around filthy island and everything a uh, little bit of decent comedy in here because you got guys who can do a little bit of the comedy chops while not completely making you dis dislike them kind of thing like this was the kind of comedy where you can have a little bit of a chuckle at what they're doing and it really didn't make anything that they do later on look stupid i guess so to speak yeah yeah uh, totally and uh Holiday's a pretty funny guy. Like he, I think he's probably the best at at doing uh, self-deprecating comedy in that company. And uh, and yeah, Hammer's a sidekick. He can play along with that. This was all right, but uh, yeah, they were just involving a few, a bit more of the talent in the uh, in the Filthy Island concept. And uh, yeah, it, I'm always happy to see uh, Dynasty appearing on the show. Yeah, so that was that was excellent. Uh, they're there to, uh, to check things out. Uh, right after that, we went to the uh, top ten from our uh, PW PWI uh, Pro Wrestling Illustrated. There, uh, do we'll go through the top ten list just real quick here. Uh, not a lot's changed except for uh, you know Jordan Oliver making it into the list as a singles competitor this week, hitting number ten. Uh, heavyweight Hustle Calvin Tankman at number nine. Uh, the other half of Injustice, Myron Reed, he's hitting up at number eight. Uh, Mil Mortez makes the list here at number seven, so being added into the mix. Uh, Richard Holiday at number six. 
We got Mods Kruger at number five, really stepping up that ladder here on the top 10 for sure. Uh, low key hitting up at number four. And again, Leo Rush really stepping up after his unification match. Uh, now at number three on this list. Number two goes to the man hosting Filthy Island himself, Filthy Tom Lawler. And then our boy Hammer, Alexander Hammerstone at number one, right behind the world's champion, Jacob Fought too. Uh Again, nothing really to debate on this list, if you ask me, Pop Smokes. Yeah, yeah, they've done a good job of it, I think, uh, basically uh, basing it on wins and losses and uh, sort of uh, momentum within the promotion. And uh, I've never uh, I've never had a spot to argue about any of those ratings. Uh, PWI's been, been doing them for decades and decades. They know how to do a top 10 list or a, a top 10 rankings list. So, uh, yeah, I agree completely. Yeah, so good, good job there. And then, uh, lo and behold, we've made it to the end of Filthy Island. It's the main event. This one was probably the most big-profile match that was listed on the card. It's why it's on the main event. Uh, this is King of the Knockouts Part 2. We got Loki on one side, and we got King Mo on the other side. Uh, you know shit's going to go down in this one, Papa Smokes. But uh, what, what were your thoughts on the match itself before we get to the finale portion of this one? Well, for one thing, I, I liked um, I liked this main event. I thought even on Filthy Island that uh, <clears throat> as we reached this uh, part in the card of the main event that it started to have that big prize fight feel to it that uh, you had the feeling that, uh, you know, that, that the match wasn't going to be decided by pinfall or something, that it was going to be a knockout or a, or a submission or a tap out of some sort. So, uh between these two guys, we've both seen uh, King Mo and Low Key uh, defeat their opponents in various methods, including knockouts and submissions. So this had like a good look to it. Of course, these are the guys that fought in King of the Knockouts number one as well uh, more than a year ago, and uh, they showed some clips of uh, of that match throughout the evening, just to give you a little feel of what happened last year and a little bit of the. Uh, history of what happened too and uh king mo winning the king of the knockouts won so i liked this uh the, the uh as junky as filthy island was meant to look it still had the prize fighting kind of feel where it's just we're gonna have an actual fight and we'll actually we'll see who wins like the better man will win and I got a little bit excited at the uh, aspect of this simply because we both know that king mo and Low key, both have a have a history with shoot fighting and such, and it, it just brings an uncertainty to the match. Where uh, man, anyone can win, and we've seen Low Key in the past couple of weeks have a couple of very quick knockout victories too. So uh, you knew this one was going to be for all the marbles, and uh, yeah, I also think uh, as the match went on, it it looked more like an MMA fight than any of their matches on this card. Um, they grappled a lot. They did a lot of striking. Um, and when I say a lot of striking, I don't mean uh, like a sling match where there's a lot of punches and a lot of kicks to the head. For more than a couple. This looked like uh, real fighting. So I like this uh, strikes and takedowns. Uh, uh, King Mo dominated the beginning of this match until... Uh, until uh, low key could reverse a few things and get a bit of momentum going and uh, until he got uh, he eventually caught uh, king mo in that uh, rear choke hold and uh, with mo crawling towards the ropes uh, the referee made the call that it was a tap out and uh, called for the end of the match what did you think of that uh, finish months and did you think the referee was uh, justified in calling that match or uh, or did you think it was a setup uh, I, I don't know that it was a setup. I think he was justified in calling in calling the match for sure. Um, I again, I you know I, I liked where it went. Uh, I really enjoyed the fact that you know we got to see Loki. I guess get one back on King Mo this time and stuff like that, yeah. which means you know this thing is definitely far from over between the two of them. Uh, and again, with all everything that's been set up throughout this entire show, this entire night. You almost thought in the back of your mind this one was going to end screwy 
against Loki. Again, you almost thought that King Mo yeah. would maybe come out on top with the help of Tom Lawler and Team Filthy at ringside, but he still managed to get one up. The referee calls it. Loki picks up the victory. And then it was time for shit to go down because we knew right then that that's when Team Filthy was going to try to get revenge now that uh, their their boy didn't pick up the victory. Yeah, and then Lawler, uh, as soon as the match was called, Lawler started uh, shouting that the referee was uh, in on it and that it was some kind of a dirty finish. You know, of all people to be saying that at this point, uh, the guy that's... Uh, screwed so many matches in the last few weeks for uh, as long as it's on his side he doesn't mind if it's a screw but uh yeah and uh, they weren't gonna have that finish they didn't like it so they uh team filthy all got in the ring surrounded low key and uh started laying some hurt on them and of course uh, we had seen that the von erics were on their way in their jeep and uh I thought they were going to drive like right into the ring kind of thing in that deep, or I thought they were going to ram the ring at first because they, they stopped so close to it. But anyway, uh, it was wild, good brawling when they got out and uh, and a uh, uh, massive pull apart at the end there. Uh, it was a nice spot where uh, Tom Lawler got thrown onto the hood of the Jeep too and uh, looked like he dented the whole hood in and broke the... Uh, windshield a bunch too and uh, yeah that, that was a good spot too and uh, just building more and more heat in this feud this is one of the main feuds in mlw and uh, they're sparing no expense to uh, to turn up the heat on it yeah it's been fantastic i mean i loved when the von erics arrived i mean things really picked up then and that beat down and everything is just great really just driving home that this is again one of their major storylines they got going on uh that uh, before even considering that tag team title return match that the Von Erichs would technically be entitled to, they've got another problem on their hands. Their focus isn't that tag title at the moment. Right now it's getting revenge on the guy and his guys who caused them to lose it in the first place, gaining back that measure of respect, and then being able to go out and hopefully comfortably get that tag team match that they not only deserve, but hopefully get it in a sense that they can go out there and have the kind of match that we know they're good at, which is a good old-fashioned tag team matchup without any of the interference from anybody else involved. Yeah, yeah. It's also kind of interesting that uh, that the uh, Von Erichs aren't, aren't currently pursuing the tag team championship again right off the bat, right after losing it, but but going after the source of their uh, sorrow is, is filthy Tom Lawler, who's always plotting against them and always uh, working against them all the time. They're going right to the source of it, and uh, and they want to defeat Team Filthy. They want to uh, wipe them out from uh, Major League Wrestling. So uh, I imagine that uh, they'll start with uh, uh, Dominic Guarini and Kevin Koo, the tag team there, Violence is Forever, and then uh, try and get their hands on Tom Lawler uh, somewhere in that program and then perhaps uh, go for the tag team championship again. We'll see how this all gets booked, but uh, we have a, a great feud starting up here between Team Filthy and the Von Erics. Well, you know, we got an MLW pay-per-view coming up down the bend. I'm almost sensing, and I'm going to put it on, on out there right now, I'm sensing a six-man tag at match coming at the pay-per-view. Uh, ACH and the Von Erics taking on Team Filthy. Yeah, I think that's a really good call, and I like the look of this match, too. Uh, they can get a, a great match out of that, and uh, if it shows up on the pay-per-view, all the better for us. We can enjoy it. Yeah, I think there's a lot going to be coming out of that upcoming pay-per-view at the end of March uh, that I'm looking forward to. A lot of build that's been happening. Uh, this this helped. I mean, it was good to see what Filthy Island was about uh, was going to become after all this weeks of talking about it. Uh, for better or for worse, there was good points. There was... Not so good points. Uh, again, i got to say the big positive overall is definitely getting something a little bit different. MLW definitely willing to go out there and try it, while at the same time still respecting all the continuity of what's going on in the company and not uh, you know, veering too far off the rails and making it make no sense where they're kind of putting themselves, you know, di digging a bit of a grave for themselves uh, trying to uh, go forward from it. Yeah, yeah, and... Uh... Uh, we still have a few more episodes to go before this uh, pay-per-view, which I think is at the end of March, right? And uh, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, we're we're gonna see all these feuds heat up. We're gonna see uh, Selena De La Renta and Mil Muertes uh, uh, going hard on the uh, on their opponents, uh, including uh, Sabio Vega. We're gonna see this uh, uh, team Filthy versus the Von Ericks. We're gonna see uh, all kinds of uh, stuff, including uh, Contra's various feuds versus uh, Injustice and Hammerstone and. Uh, I, I just I'm so excited because they've done a good job in, in get, giving a nice slow build on this stuff, and then we're going to get the big payoff in a few weeks. And uh, I'm so excited. We'll we'll do a review of of the pay per view, obviously too. And uh, yeah, this is going to be fun. And then maybe after this pay per view, some of those feuds will reset, and we'll get uh, different uh, dance partners uh, working with each other in this too. So you know, just it's a world of wrestling. It goes on and on. And, and when you have good booking, like like they have in MLW, uh, you can just look forward to more good angles and more good action. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to it each and every week. Uh, we got that build coming before the pay-per-view. I believe that's called Never Say Never. Uh, coming at the end of March. Uh, looking forward to it. Uh, anyone who hasn't done so already, if you haven't checked out MLW Fusion, head on over to YouTube or if you have the zone or FUBU TV, any of the options that there are for MLW Fusion, go and show your love and support for them. Uh, shout these guys out on social media. You know what? I see everybody doing shout outs to everybody over in WWE and AEW and you don't get a whole lot of interaction from the people working in those companies. But I'll tell you what, the MLW team, the wrestlers, everybody working there, I mean, including Court Bauer himself, is willing to interact with fans. Uh, if you got something good and positive to say, they're retweeting you out. They're reaching out to people on social media and making a difference, making the experience of being an MLW fan that much more enjoyable. So go check them out. Give them a subscribe on YouTube. Do whatever you can to support MLW Fusion. Uh, we love doing these recaps and everything and being able to watch this every single week it's been fantastic booking and we're going to continue to keep this up <coughs> oh if anybody out there though listening uh knows of any other great wrestling programs that papa smokes and i should be checking out or even just one-off shows that you think are really interesting might be down our alley let us know in the comment section below as always uh we look forward to interacting and talking to each and every one of you uh, once again, we thank you very much for tuning in to Ring Respect Radio right here on the Video Bros Network. Remember to subscribe to the channel and let all your friends know about this podcast. Share the love and help us get the name out there. We thank you very much for your time and look forward to seeing you again next time. Take care.